So today we're going to finish Philippians. Uh, we get to the end, and I wanted to look at the final three verses, um, and then and then recap just kind of the the whole book, the whole story of Philippians together. Uh, and so let's read um, Philippians four verses twenty one through twenty three. They're going to be on the screen. If you don't have your Bible, if you do, uh, verses twenty one through twenty three. So Paul writes. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. God, would you speak to us again, we ask through your word. God, may this be more than just a book, more than just um, Writings, words on a page, but may we hear and know it is your voice spoken to us through uh, your scriptures. We ask for your power for you to move in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this is uh, obviously the conclusion of, of Paul's letter uh, to his friends in Philippi. Uh, he, he is clearly uh, signing off, right? Um, you know, if we were to write a letter and you get to that like, hey, have a great day, and you sign your name. This is where we are in the, in the letter that Paul is writing to his friends in Philippi. But there's a few things, I believe, that um, as we even read these verses, we can take from this, that we can learn of God's character and what he wants for us as, as a church. Uh, the first thing is we see, he says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, right? There's a common word that we see there. What's, what's that word? Greet, right? Three times in, in two verses, Right? The, the, the biblical writers, they didn't just throw words in there because they were like, oh, we got to get to a word count. My editor wants me to hit 10,000 words. Um, they, they use repetition for emphasis. Right? There, there's, a, there's something happening here, and that's a greeting. It's a, it's a broad, general friendliness. Right? There's this expectation and assumption that, that for those who are in a church, those who are, who are Christians, that you're friendly with one another. There's just a casual greeting. Hey, tell everybody I said hi, right? I'm writing to you, you're getting off the phone. Hey, tell mom and dad, tell, tell everybody we said hey, right? It's just a friendliness that flows from Paul. There's this expectation that, man, if you're a Christian, you're gonna be friends with one another. And, and it's not even just Paul to the Philippians, right? He says, right, everyone here, especially those of Caesar's household, Paul is in Rome, 745 miles away from Philippi, Meaning, Caesar's household has probably never met the Philippians in person. And yet there's this friendliness toward them. Hey, tell them we said hi. Oh yeah, the, the, the brothers here, the, the sisters here, they say hi as well. There's this understanding that, that the church should be the friendliest place in society. I was listening to a podcast this week, and um, it was a leadership podcast, and the guest was kind of talking. She, she's, she's a visionary. She lives in the clouds. I, reckon, I, I, like, I resonate with that because I'm always just like, I've got ideas after, I, it never turns off. Like I live in the clouds, right? And she was like, I can just close my eyes and see like, this vision of what God has for the company. And, and I was like, I, I get that. Because I, I can do, like, I have a hard time going from the clouds to the ground, right, getting in, in motion, but I can close my eyes and I can see a vision for this church that God wants for us. And so I did that. I just started writing down, like, what do I see for this church? And the first thing that comes to mind when I close my eyes, and I, I'm literally right now envisioning our, our church down the road, and I see the friendliest community on the planet, that we are the most loving and welcoming and hospitable and friendliest people among one another and anyone that we encounter. That's what I see before we even dive into what are they about or what makes this church tick. That's what I see is, have you ever just seen a group of people where you don't have to talk to them, you can just observe friendliness, like a, a cheerfulness, a happiness towards one another. And that is the first thing that I, I see for our church, is that we will genuinely be friends with one another. Now, now I realize that, again, our social capacity, we can't all be the same level of friends with everybody, right? Like, again, uh, studies suggest that we can have about five friends at that deepest level, right? That if we're gonna really do friendship well, that our human capacity can handle about four to five friends 
at that deepest level. So, so obviously we can't all be at that level, but we can all be friends. That next grouping is significantly larger, and then the third grouping after that is even larger. We can all be friendly towards one another. We can all be interested in people as they come around. We're called to be friends. There's this expectation that the church of God, the people of God, and they're friends. They're, they're greeting one another. They're, they're, they're interested in one another. And so, and so let me just, let me just speak of, of what I believe we are called to be and what I hope you and I will, will reflect in this church is that you and I are called to be friendly with every person in this room. And when someone comes to knew that we're called to pursue them, proactively initiate a, a greeting with them, a friendliness with them. Again, it doesn't mean we're going to be best friends, but, but I believe that we should be friends with one another. We should pursue interest with one another. And if that's not happening, right, if, if we're, we're here, well, let me just speak candidly. If you're in this church, in this community, and you're like, I'm not, I'm not making friends, l- let, me just, let me admit there's a problem there. And let me speak lovingly yet directly. It's not them. Right? If we're, if we're like, man, it's not, it's not a friendly community. That's a problem. And it's not them. Right? Yes, every one of us, it's on, right, we should pursue friendship. We should pursue greeting. We should pursue hospitality. Right? So, so yes, it's on them, but... But if our complaint, if our frustration with the lack of friendliness in, in this church or whatever church it is that you're a part of, like it's just not very friendly. The, the problem, there's a problem, and, and if we're thinking it's them, we're the problem. I, I'm the pro, I am responsible for me, and, and you are responsible for you, right? I can pursue friendship, and I can pursue hospitality, and I can pursue greeting others. And you may think, I'm, I'm shy, I'm an introvert. And, and introverts just mean that, man, you need your alone time to fill up, right? You, you need to make sure that you have your alone time, but that's not an excuse for not being friendly, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm shy, I don't, you know, I'm nervous. Okay, I get that, but that's not an excuse for not being friendly or hospitable, right? The, the Bible assumes that the church will be friendly towards one another. Members, let me, let me speak to you directly. I believe every Sunday, every gathering, if there's a face that you don't know that person, it is your responsibility to go and introduce yourself and be friendly toward that person. Now here's the deal. You may recognize some faces, but you don't know them. Let me just encourage you Again, you're, you don't have to be like, hey, let's hang out this week, right? But you're, you're taking interest in them. You're pursuing them in the same way that Christ pursued us and, and, and welcomed us in. In that same podcast, no, nope, it was a different one. This, uh, this consultant for churches, was, he was talking about how churches nowadays are reaching less and less unchurched or, or, or non-believing people, right? That the majority of church growth and the majority of, of you know, Christian activities are, are Christians just kind of cycling around through other churches and other organizations, right? And my guess is you're like, yeah, that seems pretty accurate. Um, and so the, the interviewer says, okay, well, what, what still works then? It, it is objectively factual, that there are more unchurched and identify as I have no faith or no religion today than ever in the history of this country, right? And he says, what still works? And he said, hospitality. A genuine welcoming of people into your life because hospitality transcends all faith, transcends all beliefs, transcends all backgrounds. Every human being wants to be seen and wanted and welcomed all of us and then he he went to Luke 15 and he said in, in this in Luke 15 is the parable of the 99 sheep and the one and, and Jesus is eating um, dinner with tax collectors and sinners right and, and the, the religious people the Pharisees and the scribes are like huh, what are you doing sharing a meal with them like don't you know that they're sinners 
Don't you know that they're, they're bad people? And Jesus says, how many of you, if you had a hundred sheep and one of them wandered off, wouldn't you leave the 99 and go and pursue the one lost sheep until you found him? And then you would throw that sheep on your shoulders and rejoicing and bring that sheep back? And he's like, how, how much more should we pursue people that have, that have wandered away? And in this, this guest, he focused on one word in this, and it was the word until. And he said, how many of you w- would leave the 99 and pursue the one until he was found? And he was like, that, that's hospitality. I will pursue you until you are welcomed in. I, I will not just say hi to you as you walk in the door, but I will pursue you in friendship until you feel at home and you feel comfortable and you have found your place. I will not just, you know, talk to you one time at the office, but I will pursue you in love until you know the love of Jesus. And I thought, man, we, we like to do the, the initial thing, like, let me, oh, let me look for the one. Oh, didn't find him, right? And then we, we hunker back into our 99, and Jesus is like, hey, you are the one. Praise God that Jesus pursued you and me until he found us. Right, until he found us. He says, that, that's how we greet people. I have such an interest and a care for you that I will pursue you until you are home, until you are a part of our lives. And the Bible just, it assumes, man, that's how we're gonna treat people because that's how Jesus treated us. We're gonna greet people. We're gonna welcome people. We're gonna take interest in people because that's what Christ has done for every one of of us, if we are failing to pursue and initiate a greeting and a hospitality and a friendliness with others, we are failing to see that that's what Christ has done for us. That there's a, there's a gap, there's a breakdown somewhere. And so the first thing we just see in this is this friendliness in the church. Is that our church? We will never step off the gas of that. It will always be a value and a priority for for this family is that every person is welcomed and not just into a building but into our lives i hope you will join us in that i hope you will take ownership for that calling as well it it will transform communities because every human being wants to be loved like that we all want to be greeted and welcomed so that's the first thing that I just see when I'm reading this. It's like, man, they're just, hey, tell them we said hi. There's a greeting. Now, again, you've got people in here who've never met the Philippians in person, right? Caesar's household, right? Th- those in Rome have most likely, like you don't just hop in on a donkey and go 745 miles, right? Like you don't just road trip that, right? So there's probably people in Rome that have never met the Philippians and yet they're like, oh, hey, tell them we said hi. Like greetings, we, we we're saying hi to you, right? What, what unites them, right? What, what makes them all friends? And he says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Everyone who is united in Jesus, they're united with us. Tell them we said hi. It is that shared common faith in Jesus that immediately unites them. And though they've never met in person, never seen each other's face, never called on the phone, never shot a little text or something, they're saying, those are my people. Tell them I said hi. It made me think of uh, Texas A&M, fighting Texas Aggies. Whoop. Anybody? Okay, cool. Two of us. Awesome. A few of us, right? Objectively, everyone knows A&M is the most friendly college in the country, right? Thank you. All right, we got to... I thought we'd get some objections in here, but no. I'm just kidding. Okay, other colleges are friendly too. But I will say, A&M seems to pride itself on being friendly. All right, we like to think that we're we're friendly with one another. Now, one of the biggest traditions at A&M is, is what? The ring. There we go. I never got one. It would have helped if I had one on, right? <laughs> I never got one. I could have asked my parents, but I didn't. I bought an engagement ring instead um, because you're welcome. You know, I could have asked mom and dad, but I didn't want to. Um, and so I never got one. But, but nonetheless, like when I see someone with an Aggie ring on, I other Aggies can attest to this. I immediately am like, oh, hey, what's going on? Like, I feel like we're friends. 
you know, and it doesn't matter if they're, you know, class of, you know, 64, and, and I'm class of, oh, of 05, thank you, Thomas, we're the same class, um, right? It doesn't matter if they're class of 18, right? Immediately, we're like, oh, we've got this commonality together, and I'm guessing y'all feel the same way, Longhorns, you know? You're like, okay, we, well, I just don't know how, I mean, I know y'all are friendly, like, I, I get that, you know? It's true, it's true, you're friendly, right? You've got this immediate commonality where you're like, oh, we're, we're family, right? Like, we can talk, we can catch up, we can talk about how school was then and how it is now. We can talk about, you know, games back then versus games now. Like, there's immediate, all of these kind of boundaries, these borders, these social barriers just kind of come down, and you're like, oh, right? It's, we're friends and we're family. How much more should it be when we share the same spiritual DNA, right? How much more should we immediately be like, oh, we're, we're family and friends. We have the same spiritual DNA. Right? When I married Stephanie, I didn't even share the DNA with her family, but immediately they were my family, right? I, I cared about them because she became my family, therefore they became my family, and I cared about them. When my sister adopted two girls, before I ever met them, I cared about them because they were family, right? I would, was excited to meet them and to see them or buy them birthday presents or whatever it is because they're family. And Paul is saying, hey, if you're in Christ Jesus, you have the same spiritual DNA in you, you're family, right? We should, we should be friends. All of this stupid inner church bickering, competition, it's dumb, it makes Jesus look dumb, and he's not dumb, right? We should be a family, right? If, if you're a part of this family, you should know and care about one another because we're family, and that's what Paul says. He says, greet everyone in Christ Jesus, that uniting factor and force. That's your family. Say hi. Ask them how they're doing. Take them out to lunch. Buy him a Christmas present. We're family. Gosh, I pray that this will be a family. That, that age or race or job or bank account status or whatever won't, won't create these silly dividing lines. We'll just be like, oh man, we've got the same spiritual DNA in us. We're family. Love you. I'm for you. I love that we see that in, in Philippians. And we see that in, again, people 745 miles apart like hey man we're family right we're brothers and sisters the last thing and Stephen pointed this out and I just think this is really cool is that that last phrase in verse 22 says especially those of Caesar's household right if you remember if we go back to verse 17 just a few verses ahead I didn't send this to you Kelly you don't need to look for it um, right Paul says he's he's thanking them for their financial gift but he's like I my real desire is that I'll be able to continue ministry and your money will pay spiritual eternal dividends. But he's talking about how we're investing in eternal rewards. Caesar's household is the fruit of their investment. The fact that those in Caesar's household are greeting them in Christ means that they've come to Christ because Paul was able to share the gospel because Paul had funding from the Philippians to share the gospel in Rome and now there's family in Rome that they're like, this is the fruit of our reward. That's just cool to see, right? If you have been encouraged by this church family, there are those back in DFW who have funded so much of what happens here, like they deserve to know the fruit of that investment. Because we're investing in kingdom work. Man, just such a cool picture. He's like, hey, these people, you haven't met them yet, but they love Jesus in part because of your investment. They say hi. Man, what a cool picture. So Paul is like, hey, greet everyone. Or family. And then he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is like his, his signing off, his final farewell. Every day I drop the kids off at school. Uh, Macy is one of them. And I say, hey, I love you. Have a great day. Or make it a great day. Or, or something along those lines, right? It, it's, it's that last like, hey, see you. En enjoy the day. And that's what Paul's doing. He's saying, hey, I love you. M may you know more of the grace of Jesus Christ today. 
Like that's his hope for them. Have a great day. No more of the grace of Jesus. Right? Grace is an undeserved gift of, of love and kindness, right? I show someone grace as I love them, as I'm kind to them, regardless of if they deserve it, regardless of, of if they can give it back. Right? That's just grace. It's just going to give you love and kindness. And Paul says, man, I hope you know more of the grace of Jesus today. The grace of Jesus is, is that while we were hostile towards God, he pursued us in love, not because we deserved it, not because we were lovely. The, the Bible says we were actually moving away from him in rebellion and rejection, and God is pursuing us in Christ. Right? How, how many of you, when someone is hostile towards you, are, are thinking, let me actively pursue you in love? Let me actively do good to you when you're being hostile towards me. That's the grace of Christ for you and me, is that we, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we had turned the corner and cleaned ourselves up. Not while we had been like, okay, let me contemplate this. I'm thinking about it. That's when Jesus stepped in. No, while we were actively sinning against him with no desire for him, Christ died for us. That's the grace of Jesus for you and me. And, and how we enter into a relationship is by trusting that, but then it never goes away. We just know it more and more and more and more and more. Right? It's not like in a marriage, I know love once. Like, it's like, hey, I love you. Great. Don't need to ever say that again. Right? Don't need to know that more. No. Like, our love is just more, it's more rich and more nuanced and more vibrant as time goes and as we spend life. We don't ever graduate from the grace of Jesus. We know it more and more and more, and it's more beautiful. And Paul's like, gosh, that's what I want you to know today. Have a great day. I love you. Know the grace of Jesus. I think if we know the grace of Jesus more, our lives will never be the same. That's just, tomorrow will be better than it is today. Tuesday will be better than Monday. And we would know the grace of Jesus. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Paul, as he's wrapping up his letter, he says, hey, tell everyone I said hi. Love you guys. I hope you know the grace of Jesus today. Folds it up, seals it, stamps it, sends it on its way. As we've read through the book of Philippians and we've spent a few months now uh, in it, I, I just wanted to kind of just summarize the whole book and just kind of talk through it in, in a couple minutes from beginning to end. As I thought about, like, how would I summarize Philippians, I, I kept coming back to, to really the same, the same point. Paul, talking to his friends, writing a letter, says, my beloved and cherished friends, may you live your lives fully in a way that honors Jesus. Because there's nothing of greater value than knowing him and becoming like him. The book starts, the letter starts, Paul, with, with clear affection, thanking them. Because for over 10 years since he started this church, they have been funding his ministry as best as they can. And, and he's thanking them for their, their input, their, their partnership in the advance of the gospel. And he says, even though I'm presently in prison, it's okay. Paul's in prison when he's writing this letter. He says, even though I'm presently in prison, it's okay because the gospel is still advancing. Within the, 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 the prison community, I'm able to share Jesus, and those outside are more encouraged because they see my faith, and so now they're sharing more boldly. And he says, that's all I want, is for the gospel to advance to all people in all places. I want to honor Christ in all of life, whether I'm, I'm living or whether in my death, I want everything about me to be to the honor of Christ. And he says at the end of verse of chapter one, and that's what I want for you as well. That you would live lives worthy of the gospel. That all of life, every morning and, and, and noon and, and evening and every day of the week would be lived in such a way that Christ is honored with your life. That's what I want for you, he says. And he says, now listen to me. Do nothing, do absolutely nothing from selfish ambition 
but rather in humility consider others more significant than yourself. Look to the increase of God in your life and others in your life before yourself. We, we ought to live this way because that's how Christ lived for us. That Christ, though he was rightful in his place in heaven, king of the universe, humbled himself to come and not just live among us, but to stoop low and to serve us. Jesus, the, the creator of the world, the, the second member of the Trinity, stepped off his throne to come and to serve us to the point of dying on the cross for our sins. It was his humility, his willingness to stoop low and lift us up that gave us life. That's how we should treat and live towards others. The same humility that Christ gave to us. Therefore, because of that humility, church, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In humble reverence to God, put in the work to become like Jesus. Work out your salvation. Don't grumble or dispute among one another. That's what those who don't know Jesus do. Instead, shine brightly like the light of Jesus to all people. Look at Timothy. Look at Epaphroditus. They're models, they're examples of how we can live the reflection of Jesus well. Gosh, there's nothing of greater value than knowing and being like Jesus. He's the only way Listen, he's the only way that you and I can have life with God. Right? He, Jesus came and he lived the perfect life that you and I were expected to live. God expected us to live from day one to the end in complete obedience and perfection to him. Right? None of us have done that. I tried, Paul said. I tried my best to live up to that standard, but, but when compared to the holiness of Jesus, I fell infinitely short. But Jesus came and he lived that perfect life that you and I were supposed to live as our representative. That he could lead the way back to God. But it's not just his perfect life, he also died on the cross for our sins. You and I, we all had a debt against God that we could not pay back. I could not pay back what I owed God, so Jesus paid that debt for me. On the cross, that's why he went to the cross, was our sins had to be punished. It only makes sense God is just. Our sins have to be punished. So either we can suffer that punishment or Jesus can suffer it in our place. And then he rose from the dead. If Jesus is still dead, we have no hope. Our faith is dead. But if Jesus is alive, then our faith is alive and our hope is alive. He's the only way that we can be restored to a relationship with God. And there's nothing in this entire world of greater value or worth than knowing Jesus and becoming like him. Don't chase after lesser things that will leave you lacking in the end. Press on to know him. Press on with your whole life to know him and to grab hold of him and to become like him. Forget what lies behind. Strain forward to what's ahead. He's worth it. Remember, everybody, agree together in the Lord. Don't dispute among one another. It doesn't reflect the unity of God. Rejoice in the Lord always. You're going to go through hard days. You're going to suffer. But God is still on his throne. His truth is the same. The gospel is the same. His forgiveness is the same. We can rejoice in him even when our circumstances are bad. Be gentle and easy with one another. Be easy to be around. Don't be difficult. Don't be cranky. Time is short. People need to know Jesus. And if you're difficult to be around, we're making it more difficult for them to know Jesus. Don't be anxious about anything. But take all of your anxieties and give them to God in prayer. He cares for you more than you know. He is a good father, actively involved in your life. You're going to be anxious? Take them, give them to him. He will take care of it. Always think about what is good, true, and right. Don't fill your minds with junk. What you think about is what you'll become. Think about Jesus. Think about what's true. 
and holy and right. And you'll be transformed to become more like him. Gosh, I love you so much, Paul says in chapter four. I don't want you to worry about me. I have needs, but I'm not needy. I've learned that I have everything I need in Jesus. I can be content in him whether I have a lot or a little. So I have needs, but I'm good because I have Christ and he's all I need. Even so, thank you so much for your gift, for for giving generously so that the work and the advance of the gospel can continue. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Well, all right, tell everyone we said hi. And by the way, those in Caesar's household say hi too. Can you believe that? Those in Caesar's household. That's the fruit of your increase. Have a good day. I love you. May you know the grace of Jesus more and more. Amen. That's the, that's Paul's letter. So, church, friends, some of you I know, some of you I just met, my beloved and cherished friends, live your lives fully to know and become like Jesus. In this world, every day, you and I can chase after various things. Some of them are good. Some of them are not. You know this. I know this. All of them are inferior to knowing and being like Jesus. There is nothing of greater value or worth than you can ever grab in this life than him. So live your lives fully to honor Christ. He is worth it. Press on. Love one another. In the name of Jesus.